Hi, Alan. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Uh, my name is Aubrey. I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic and I'm a member of this group. And tonight we start chapter one of the big book, Bill's story on page one. We're going to start off with Bill's story and, and Bill's story plays a very important part in the recovery process for every alcoholic that came after Bill. Because Bill found out from the doctor and through his experiences with the doctor when he finally got sober, that one alcoholic talking to another alcoholic was what was required to get the confidence and the, the trust of the other alcoholic. And the alcoholic telling the story has to be able to be identifiable by every other alcoholic. You have to identify with Bill. So Bill tells a story in here to help us identify that, yes, we have the same alcoholic tendencies he had. We have the same disease, the same mental obsession, the same physical allergy, that, that same obsession that he did. And when we can relate to him, and then he tells us how he got over it, then it's much easier for us to get over it. So it's very important. And they decided that when they were a few years after this, they, when they wrote the book, they decided Bill's story would be chapter one so that all the alcoholics could uh, relate to it. It starts off, and, and what we want to look at here is his progression through the disease of alcoholism. And when he started displaying the allergy, when we saw the allergy manifest in, in him, you know, it wasn't the first time he drank, but later on, it started to, to show that he had the obsession and the allergy. And so we want to see that, his progression through. And also look at some of the things that he was thinking, where his mind was while this was happening. He had a big ego. He had big ambitions. He was proud, very dogged to go after things. And sometimes it paid off for him. Other times it didn't. And the more he drank, the less it paid off for him. So we're going to look at all of that as we go through this. So it starts off, Bill's story, chapter one. War fever ran high in New England town to which we knew young officers from Plattsburgh were assigned. And we were flattered when the first citizens took us into their homes, making us feel heroic. Here was love, applause, war. Moments sublime with intervals hilarious. I was part of life at last. And in the midst of the excitement, I discovered alcohol. So this is the first time he drank. And this is at a party where they're just sending him away to go to war. And he got his ego built up really big. You know, he was a hero. He felt like a hero there. And I can certainly relate to him when he said, when it says moments sublime and intervals hilarious. Many times when I was drunk, I had moments sublime and intervals hilarious. I can relate to him already. It goes on. I forgot the strong warnings and the prejudices of my people concerning drink. In time, we sailed over there. I was very lonely and again turned to alcohol. We landed in England. I visited Winchester Cathedral. Much moved, I wandered outside. My attention was caught by a doggerel on an old tombstone. Doggerel is a, like a poem. It says, here lies Hampshire Grenadier, who caught his death drinking cold, small beer. A good soldier is ne'er forgot whether he dieth by musket or by pot. And that's not pot, the wacky weed. That's how they drank beer back then. They had a pot of beer. So that was referring to beer. And he has ominous warning, which I failed to heed. So Bill throws in the point there that he knew his family had told him, stay away from booze. Don't drink. And he forgot all about that when he was at the party and going overseas. And he started drinking. And they came back from the war. And he says, 22, and a veteran of foreign wars, I went home at last. I fancied myself a leader 
For had not the men of my battery given me a special a token of appreciation, my talent for leadership, I imagined, would place me at the head of vast enterprises, which I would manage the, with the utmost assurance. Again, his ego is getting bigger. He fancied himself. Fancied wasn't real. Fancied. And he imagined that he would lead vast enterprises. And for a while, he did. And he was very sure of himself. Joe and Charlie says, Bill was full of himself. And it goes on to say, I took a night law course and obtained employment as investigator for a surety company. Surety company is an insurance company. The drive for success was on. I proved to the world I was important. My work took me around about Wall Street, and little by little, I became interested in the market. Many people lost money, but some became very rich. Why not I? So he was, I am getting, getting to be rich, very ambitious, very greedy. He said, I studied economics and business as well as the law. Potential alcoholic that I was, so he recognized the fact that he was maybe on his way to being an alcoholic. He says, I nearly failed my law course. At one of the finals, I was too drunk to think or to write. Though my drinking was not yet continuous, it disturbed my wife. We had long talks when I would steal her forebodings by telling her that men of genius conceive their best projects when drunk. So he's already justifying and rationalizing his drinking to his wife and trying to get Lois to calm down. Just, everything's okay. All the, all the smart guys drink a lot. He was trying to rationalize and justify it and make excuses. Uh, by the time I had completed the course, I knew the law was not for me. The inviting maelstrom of Wall Street had me in its grips. Business and financial leaders were my heroes. Out of this alloy of drink and speculation, I commenced to forge the weapon that one day would turn in its flight like a boomerang and all but cut me to ribbons. So he's becoming aware of the fact that his lifestyle that he was developing and the drinking and the going after the money and doing all those things that he did when he got caught up in the maelstrom, the whirl of, of Wall Street, that was what that attitude and approach towards life is what eventually got him into trouble with alcohol later on. He goes, living modestly, my wife and I saved a thousand dollars. Back then, that was a lot of money. Uh, it went into certain securities, then cheap and rather unpopular. I rightly imagined that they would someday have great rise. I failed to persuade my broker friends to send me out looking over factories and management, but my wife and I decided to go anyway. I had developed a theory that most people lost money in stocks through ignorance of markets. I discovered many more reasons later on. Bill went, even though the people that really ran Wall Street told him this is a dumb idea, don't do it, you know, he did it anyway. And it turns out it was not a bad idea. And he went around, they were, you know, he went around the whole East Coast go into companies and seeing how companies ran, see if they were being run well, see, talk to the, to the, to the employers, to the employees of the company, found, you know, looked at their books if he could, looked at their products and gathered some information, which later became pretty important to the people in Wall Street. And he was pretty successful. He got some contracts when he, when he got back after this year, they were pretty poor during this year. Uh, they had a little bit of savings, but they were riding around in a motorcycle with a sidecar. They had a tent and all that stuff in it, which we'll read about. You know, it's quite a year that they spent on the road. We gave up our positions and off we were on a motorcycle. The sidecar stuffed with tent, blankets, 
a change of clothes, and three large volumes of financial reference service. Our friends thought a lunacy commission should be appointed. Perhaps they were right. I had had some success at speculation, so we had a little money, but we once worked on a farm for a month to avoid drawing on our small capital. Uh, that was the last honest manual labor on my part for many a day. The real truth about that, as it turns out, is Bill was still drinking, and he's drinking pretty heavily. And he was usually too drunk to drive the motorcycle, so Lois had to drive the motorcycle. And then when they went to work, they worked on a farm as sharecroppers. They were picking picking vegetables out of in the field. Well, Bill always figured a way to get out of doing that. He'd go into town and say, I've got to go wire somebody and try to get us some money so we don't have to spend the money we have. So he'd go into town, you know, and he'd hang out in town all day and be drinking and getting drunk while Lois is picking the vegetables in the fields, you know, and then he would get drunk. He'd come home and go to sleep and she would drive to the next place that they were going to. So that was quite a year. For the next few years, fortune threw money and applause my way. I had arrived. My judgment and ideas were followed by many to the tune of paper millions. The great boom of the late 20s was seething and swelling. Drink was taking an important and exhilarating part of my life. There was loud talk in the jazz places uptown. Everyone spent in thousands and chattered in millions. Scoffers could scoff and be damned. I made a host of fair-weather friends. So Bill was swinging. You know, it was the late 20s. He was rolling in money. He was actually doing pretty good. And he got, he, he gathered quite a bit of money. And he was successful. But drink was taking an important role in his life. You know, it got more and more a part of his life. But at this point, he's exhilarated by the drinking. Okay, he's liking the drinking. We'll read a little further and see what happens. He goes, my drinking assumed more serious proportions, continuing all day and almost every night. Remonstrances of my friends terminated in a row, and I became a lone wolf. There were many unhappy scenes in our sumptuous apartment. There had been no real infidelity for loyalty to my wife, helped at times by extreme drunkenness, kept me out of those scrapes. So this drinking that he was exhilarated by was also beginning to cause quite a few problems at home. He was drinking all day and drinking all night, drunk all the time, wasn't getting along with Lois at, at the moment. And all his friends turned him away. He was a lone wolf. I can definitely identify with Bill. There was times that people just, you know, sorry, pal. You're just drinking too much. You got to quit drinking. You're drinking way too much. We don't even want to be around you. I mean, that has happened to me. So I know how that is. So I can definitely identify with Bill and how it started as just a few drinks at a party when he was going away to now being consumed by it. That money talks. That money becomes big. You know, you're buying all the drinks in the bar. You get a hot shot in the bar. And they were fair weather friends because when they finally got tired of his actions and his attitude, they just cut him loose. So his money couldn't buy the drinks anymore. Couldn't buy the praise. Couldn't buy the pats on the back anymore. He made a host of fair weather friends. In 1929, I contracted golf fever. We went at once to the country. My wife to applaud while I started out to overtake Walter Hagen. Walter Hagen was the best golf player in the world in the late 20s. Liquor caught up with me much faster than I came up behind Walter. So the golfing was really just an excuse to drink more. It was always the 19th hole. You know, after they finished golf, they ended up in the 19th hole, which is the name of the bar at the clubs, at the golf clubs. And he drank and drank and drank. He goes, I began to be jittery in the morning. 
golf permitted drinking every day and every night. It was fun to carry him around the exclusive course, which had inspired such awe in me as a lad. I acquired the impeccable coat of tan one sees upon the well-to-do. More ego, more trying to be something he's not, trying to be the, the jet setter to, you know. The local banker watched me whirl fat checks in and out of his till with amused skepticism. So the bankers knew that he's playing with fire. Abruptly in October 1929, hell broke loose on the New York Stock Exchange. After one of those days of inferno, I wobbled from a hotel bar to the brokerage office. It was 8 o'clock. Five hours after the market closed, the ticker still chattered. I was staring at an inch of tape which bore the inscription XYZ32. It had been 52 that morning. So it lost a lot of money. I was finished and so were many friends. The papers reported men jumping to their death from the towers of high finance. That disgusted me. I would not jump. I went back to the bar. My friends had dropped several million since 10 o'clock. So what? Tomorrow's another day. As I drank, the old fierce determination to win came back. So that was the crash of 1929. And that really, that wrecked the stock market. That ruined a lot of people. And it's true, people would jump out the windows of the in New York, just jumped out windows because they had just lost everything. It was very devastating. And it set, you know, a time in the 30s where life was not that great in the United States at that time. Bill got caught up in it. He had lost a lot of all that money that he made, all that ego that made him really reach out and try to be that ambitious. He had all that money at one point. Bankers smiling at him as he threw the money around. Next thing you know, he's got no money left. So he, he, he made a lot, but he lost it all. It says, the next morning, I telephoned a friend in Montreal. He had plenty of money left, and I thought I'd better go to Canada. By the following spring, we were living in our accustomed style. I felt like Napoleon returning from Elba. No St. Helena for me. But drinking caught up with me again. And my generous friend had to let me go. This time, we stayed broke. Bill was smart. He was a smart, intelligent guy. When the market crashed in the United States, he called his friend in Canada. And he went to Canada. He, he knew where the money was, and he went to where the money was. But his drinking messed up the deal with his friend. And, you know, his, again, drinking messed him up with when there was no money to be found in in the United States, because of the, the the crash of the market, he went to Canada where there was money, and then he blew that whole deal because he was drinking too much. So the guy had to fire him, let him go. And then there was no place, so they stayed broke. We went to live with my wife's parents. I found a job, then lost it as a result of a brawl with a taxi driver. You think he was maybe drunk when he had the fight with the taxi driver? Might maybe. Mercifully, no one could guess that I was to have no real employment for five years or hardly draw a sober breath. So now Bill is in almost constant drinking. He's constantly drunk. He's drinking all day until late at night. He says, My wife began to work in a department store, coming home exhausted to find me drunk. I became an unwelcome hanger on at brokerage places. So now he couldn't go anywhere. He couldn't go, you know, he had no more places to work. He was so drunk all the time. You know, they told him, look, you're drunk. You know, you're hung over. You're not making any sense. You smell bad. You're dirty. We, we can't have you hanging around here. You're, you're embarrassed us in front of our customers. And they threw them all out. They got rid of them. Nobody wanted him because he drank so much. And this was a guy that had previously helped them guys make money. They wanted him to be there. 
when he went on the road for that year and he brought back some data from all the companies and he explained it to him that he says, I went out and saw these companies. I, I touched them. I saw that stuff. They figured out that with that kind of data, they could readily invest in those companies because those companies were solid. You know, they had no way of figuring that out before. He had a theory that ended up working. And they made money. When he came back using that data, they made money. So they wanted him when he was sober. But it got to be the point that he was never sober. So all that knowledge, no matter what he knew, they couldn't take it. They couldn't take him being that crazy. So they, they got rid of him. And then the next is is where it really changed. He goes, liquor ceased to be a luxury. It became a necessity. Bathtub gin, two bottles a day, and often three, got to be routine. Sometimes a small deal would net me a few hundred dollars, and I would pay my bills at the bars and delicatessens. This went on endlessly, and I began to waken very early in the morning, shaking violently. A tumbler full of gin followed by half a dozen bottles of beer would be required if I were to eat breakfast. Nevertheless, I still thought I could control the situation. And there were periods of sobriety which renewed my wife's hope. But I can definitely identify with Bill for this. I used to get up in the morning and put two shots of rum and a cup of coffee and have three cups of coffee that way and then tell my friends, I'm not going to drink today. And they're looking at me like, what do you mean you're not going to drink? You just put two shots of rum and every cup of coffee you had. And I go, well, that's just flavoring. Like I wouldn't even justify that as drinking. So I had six shots or eight shots of rum before I ever went to work. So I can definitely identify with Bill. I can identify with where he was. And I was the reason I was drinking is because I, I got up and I was so hung over that if it wasn't for those drinks, I couldn't function. And Bill was there. Bill had gotten to that point. And it says, gradually things got worse. The house was taken over by the mortgage holder. My mother-in-law died and my wife and father became ill. I got a promising business opportunity. Stocks are at a low point in 19, of 1932. And I had somehow formed a group to buy. I was to share generously in the profits. Then I went on a prodigious bender and that chance vanished. So he tried to pull it out again he had it he got the deal together he stayed sober long enough to get the deal together and right before he got the deal closed and he would have made a bunch of money he went out and got drunk and blew the whole deal and he did that more than one time and i remember doing that too i remember missing job appointments job interviews just because uh, you know i was a little nervous before i went so i thought i'd have a drink before i went to the interview well I never made it to the interview. So, I mean, I remember those times. So I can identify with Bill's anguish here. And then he does step one. He says, I woke up. This had to be stopped. I saw I could not take so much as one drink. I was through forever. Before then, I had written lots of sweet promises, but my wife happily observed that this time I meant business, and so I did. Shortly afterwards, I came home drunk. There had been no fight. Where had been my high resolve? I simply didn't know. It hadn't even come to mind. Someone had pushed a drink my way, and I had taken it. Was I crazy? I began to wonder, for such an appalling lack of perspective seemed near being just that. Uh, renewing my resolve, I tried again. Some time passed, and confidence began to be replaced by cocksuredness. I could laugh at the gin mills. Now I had what it takes. One day I walked into a cafe to telephone. In no time, I was beating on the bar, asking myself 
how it happened. As the whiskey rose to my head, I told myself I could manage better next time. But I might as well get good and drunk then, and I did. The remorse, horror, and hopelessness of the next morning are unforgettable. The courage to do battle was not there. My brain raced uncontrollably, and there was a terrible sense of impending calamity. And I remember I used to say, you know, I have this feeling of impending doom. And a guy said to me one day, well, do you know what that feeling is? I go, no, what? He goes, it's impending doom. You know, you're feeling like there's impending doom coming because it is. Because you're drinking so much, you're going to there's you're, you're going to crash and burn. And I did. So he says, I hardly dare cross the street lest I collapse and be run down by an early morning truck. For it was scarcely daylight. An all-night place supplied me with a dozen glasses of ale. My writhing nerves were stilled at last. A morning paper told me the market had gone to hell again. Well, so had I. The market would recover, but I wouldn't. That was the hard thought. Should I kill myself? No, not now. Then a mental fog settled down. Jen would fix that. So two bottles and oblivion. So here, Bill knew that he was in a place where he was powerless over alcohol and drank anyway. And he finally drank, not for the effect, not to get rid of a problem, not to solve anything. He drank to reach oblivion. The worst case scenario for a drinker is to just drink until you're in oblivion. You don't know what's coming or going. You don't know where you are. You don't know what you're doing. You're totally blacked out in oblivion. You just, you said nothing. Nothing is working for you or against you. You're in oblivion. And this is the state he got in in just a short period of time. And he had hit bottom time after time after time, swearing that that was his bottom. And what did he do? He picked up a drink again. He knew he was powerless over alcohol. That idea had come to him. He knew he could not quit. He tried. Then he said, well, should I kill myself? Well, no, I'm not going to kill myself. So what did he do? Instead of killing himself, he drank. Well, what was drinking doing? Drinking was killing him. So we'll, we'll go further with this next week. We'll um, pick up there because, believe it or not, it gets worse. So thank you all for listening, and we'll pick that up next week. And back to you, Alan.